All right, looks like it's 9 a.m. Uh, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Carissa Chu. I'm a fifth year resident at UCSF in urology. Um, it's my great uh, honor to welcome Dr. Joshua Meeks from Northwestern University, who will be here to talk to us this morning about upper tract urethelial carcinoma. Uh, so without further ado, Dr. Meeks, thank you very much. Thanks, Krista. So I'm gonna uh, have a good amount to go through today. Um, I've made all the slides available, so feel free to take a look online. These are my disclosures. I don't really think any of them are particularly relevant today other than uh, Janssen, which is one of the agents we're gonna talk about that is involved in FGF receptor three inhibitors. So the, the basic framework of what I'm gonna talk about today is we'll have a little bit in the beginning on some of the molecular biology. I think this is critical for us uh, to have an understanding of this because we're taking care of this disease on, on many fronts. Then we're gonna go into some more basic stuff that I'm, I'm sure many folks have heard, uh, sort of the risk factors, how we evaluate upper tract. Uh, then we're gonna talk about some guideline-based treatments. Most of that's gonna be endoscopic and surgery. And then the talk's gonna move into some of the more things on the cutting edge. It's gonna involve systemic therapy and, um, and targeted agents. Again, I think it's really important that us as urologists are involved in this uh, because these are collaborations between us and the medical oncologists. And, and again, I think it's really important that we continue to play a, a major role here. So just so we're all starting from the same basic platform, uh, we're gonna talk about upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And specifically, uh, we're gonna be talking about kidneys that or carcinomas that affect the lining of the renal pelvis and the ureter, and even a little bit of the ureter as it goes into the bladder, the intramural ureter. And, and that's pretty small as far as the amount of, of urethelial carcinoma that we're actually gonna be talking about. So in general, about five to 10% of all urethelial cancers are considered upper tract urethelial cancers. And it, it, I think the more we learn about this cancer, the more we think that it's not just you know, the second cousin to bladder cancer, that it is somewhat of a unique entity and probably should be treated that way. So we know that, for example, the male to female ratio is a little bit closer to two to one, whereas for bladder cancer, it's closer to four to one. Patients tend to be a little bit older in age than bladder cancer, and they present at a higher stage. And you, and you can imagine a lot of that has to do with our limitations as far as, um, staging and accurately identifying patients with upper tract urethelial carcinoma. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the molecular biology here. This is all very interesting kind of work. Again, if you keep an eye on this, there's papers coming out almost on a weekly basis. The reason I'm presenting this again is that there's some concepts here that if you start to appreciate them, this is not just rote memorization, it, it actually makes a lot, of, a lot of sense. So just starting with the basics, so this is a urethelial lining and you can see here that, you know, the line is made of multiple stratified layers of epithelium. And the important layers that we really know about are there's a basal layer, right, that's in touch with the lamina propria, and then stratified layers, and then an umbrella cell at the top. So if you think about it, there's really three main components, a basal layer, an intermediate layer of development, and then a superficial layer. And the cancers that we have have different features depending on what stage of development that cancer develops in. And so this is from the Cancer Genome Atlas that was published in 2017. And this is all bladder cancer. But what I'd like you to pay particular attention to, this is a, a heat map of these cancers. And there's a particular kind of bladder cancer that has, is enriched in epithelial differentiation. You can see that they're enriched and all that is red here. And those have high markers of uroplakins. And again, those are considered luminal cancers. In many ways, these kinds of bladder cancers look like our upper tract cancers, which are have a high expression of these kind of luminal markers. So if you're to say that bladder cancer and upper tract cancer are similar in any regard, much of that has to do with a certain kind of bladder cancer that is expresses more markers of differentiation. And in general, those do pretty well. So throughout this talk, I'm going to have a bunch of sort of major take-home points if you're multitasking and checking email and doing a bunch of other stuff, if you could just even just take, get the major take homes, I think that's gonna be hopefully helpful to you. Now, people have started looking at the unique genetic features of upper tract, and probably the biggest difference between upper tract and bladder cancer is the presence of 
FGF receptor alterations. And then this is an early paper from the Memorial Group from John Sfacchiano. So I think many of you that are at uh, Sinai could hopefully get to work with John. The mutations that were found in upper tract are around 55% of tumors. So more than half of cancers have an upper tract or have a FGF receptor alteration. And if you contrast that with bladder cancer, it's much less. It's probably close to 15 to 20%. Interestingly, in bladder, the highest gene with, that's altered is P53. And you can see in this case, it's only 18%. This is sort of a visual comparison of that with upper tract tumors shown here on the left and bladder cancer on the right. And again, you can see RB1, P53, they're all in the same pathway, much more enriched in bladder cancer, whereas in upper tract, it's really RAS and FGF receptor 3. Interestingly, if you compare early stage versus muscle invasive and metastatic upper tract, and that's shown here. So these are the stage two or less than stage two. These are all stage two or higher. These are metastatic patients. You can see that the frequency of FGF receptor three alteration goes down over the course of stage, whereas P53 goes up. So in this case, 11, 39, and 31%. I think, you know, again, a comparison of upper tract and bladder uh, really shows that upper tract is much more common for FGF receptor 3 alteration. So major take home point here is that uh, FGF receptor 3 is probably the most important and common driver for upper tract. And we're going to get to that more when we talk about therapy because now we have drugs that can target FGF receptor 3. Um, a major question about the basic biology of clonality, people always wonder and people have upper tract followed by bladder cancer, is this just a field effect change? Um, meaning that is the whole lining of the epithelium just developing cancer spontaneously or are these dropped tumors? And that was actually studied in a, in a very nice way. So this is from a nice study of around 200 patients. 57 of them ended up having secondary bladder cancer and this is a comparison of them. And I just kind of want to show you at high power. So this was the patient's upper tract tumor this was the patient's bladder cancer, and this was the metastasis. And the overlap is shown here in these Venn diagrams. And you can see, for example, this one didn't have as much of an overlap, whereas most of these did. Over the course of the entire 57 patients, 86% of alterations were shared. And so I, I think you can say that for the most part, a patient that goes on and has an upper tract followed by a bladder cancer, it's gonna be the same alterations that are present in those. And that's another major take home point is again, people who develop secondary bladder cancer, those probably came from the upper tract. So we're gonna to transition to the part of the talk that's much more clinical related stuff that you're gonna see on, you know, in the clinic and in the operating room. So the most common signs and symptoms for upper tract cancer, the patients are probably come in with hematuria. And during that time, you're gonna do either an endoscopic evaluation or a CAT scan, uh, and you're gonna find a filling defect. And so, uh, hematuria is the most common thing. If someone's got back pain, that's probably from obstruction or advanced cancer. Anorexia, again, if they're, if they're anorexic, they're already having weight loss, they already probably have metastatic spread, and then fatigue. Uh, other things that can look like upper tract cancer on CT findings, and that would be a blood clot, stones, fungus ball. Uh, again, I think those are things you're going to see when you actually go take a look. So these are the risk factors, and you know many of these are very similar to what you see as risk factors for bladder cancer. Uh, smoking is probably the most common thing, uh, with 60 to 70 percent of patients that have a smoking history. Of course, having a history of prior bladder cancer, that frequency of developing a secondary upper tract cancer ranges anywhere from seven to 0.8 percent. I think we are probably that number is going down just as we get better epidemiologic data. Um, Lynch syndrome is something that obviously is relatively unique for upper tract, and we tend to find that more in females compared to males. Up to 15% of patients with Lynch syndrome will have an upper tract cancer. There's some recommendations that people should have, patients with Lynch should have a yearly screening UA uh, to see if they have any kind of upper tract pathology. Aristocolic acid, that's in some teas and some different diet aids. And then uh, interestingly, there's again, some concept that if you have a bladder cancer and you get stinted, uh, that puts you at risk for an upper tract tumor. I don't uniformly avoid stents in these patients, but there's some retrospective data that that's something that we should continue to investigate. 
Now I'm going to show some data um, that our guidelines, and these are all the European guidelines. I think they have a much higher quality guideline-based data. We don't currently have a guideline from the AUA uh, for upper tract. Um, the NCCN, it's kind of at the very end of that guideline, but nicely the European guideline is focused on upper tract. And so if you want more reading, I recommended that as well as um, our AUA has some very nice information in its coursework. But again, a lot of that cites the European guideline. So for evaluation, uh, I think the gold standard is probably a CT urogram. Um, retrogrades are fine for patients that can't get contrast. I still, still think it's helpful to do a non-contrast CT, again, because you're going to see something like adenopathy. Um, then that usually is followed up by ureteroscopy, and that can help differentiate a, a renal cell versus an upper tract carcinoma. When you're doing a ureteroscopy, you're going to do a biopsy, and the goal of that is not to necessarily get staging data as be able to identify high grade versus uh, low grade cancer. Um, in patients who have a normal retrograde but abnormal findings, it's not uncommon to do cytologies and that may help localize a patient if they're in early stage. So we have two tables here. Uh, the white table is the level of evidence and the blue table is the recommendations for how to implement those. And again, all of this is from the European guidelines. So their, uh, their summary of evidence was that CT is probably best, followed by ureteroscopy, and that's a level of evidence of two. Selective urinary cytology is a high sensitivity in high-grade cancers and carcinoma in situ, and that a bladder evaluation should be performed to evaluate for secondary cancers or other cancers in the bladder. So the recommendations then are to perform uh, cystoscopy to evaluate the bladder, a CT to do uh, to evaluate the, the upper tracts and staging, and then a diagnostic ureteroscopy. So my take home for this, again, is uh, CT imaging is probably the best way to identify these patients followed by ureteroscopy. So the kinds of pathologies that we deal with, uh, number one, in the benign disease on the right, I think that uh, these are rare. Uh, you have to assume that most people with any kind of upper tract filling defect is cancer until proven otherwise, but you will, you know, find these benign diseases. So a fibroepithelial polyp, an inverted papilloma. Um, again, from an oncologic perspective, the vast majority of these are going to be urothelial carcinoma with some rarer cases of squamous small cell and adeno. I've, I've seen a, a few of those, but those are much more rare. Now our staging, it's a standard TNM staging, and you can always go take a look at those. Um, all of this, for the most part, is pathologic staging. So the patient's already had a nephro U, they've had a distal ureterectomy, and then you have to stage the patient appropriately. And most of this is very similar, where you have subepithelial invasions of T1, muscle invasions could be a T2. I think the key thing from clinical staging prior to the operating room for taking someone's kidney out is that you really can't do that. Again, you're gonna have high grade and low grade. And so that's gonna probably be the major take home for how you treat patients, is that grade is gonna be a surrogate for stage and high grade tumors are bad and you should be treated aggressively. This is a nice description of prognostic factors and you've got preoperative factors here on the right and then postoperative here on the left. And you can see that they are listed from those factors that have been shown to have a major impact at the top and a minor impact on the bottom. Again, having a bigger tumor preoperatively uh, is the, has the highest prognostic factor, multifocality and grade. Interestingly, postoperatively, it's stage, grade, CIS, bladder cuff, CI, and then uh, lymphovascular invasion. You actually don't get down to lymph node involvement until about halfway down here. Now we have a risk adapted approach. <clears throat> and again, the whole purpose for a risk adapted approach is really try to do nephron sparing whenever possible, but also not, not letting the aggressiveness of the cancer get too far along and you've missed your window for cure. So low risk tumors are generally those that you're gonna manage endoscopically. And so those are gonna be single tumors that are small and are low grade, again, that you can manage reteroscopically. If you can't manage them ureteroscopically for some reason, whether it's stricture or the pit, you can't get access to the renal pelvis, even if it's low grade, you're often gonna have to treat those patients as high grade. And the high risk patients, um, 
you know, you're gonna, those are tumors with, that have hydronephrosis, usually from obstruction. I don't think I've really ever seen a low grade tumor that causes hydronephrosis. Uh, bigger tumors, bigger than two centimeters, high grade cytology, and then a high grade biopsy. So major take home here, high grade, high risk, you're probably gonna most likely have to consider a nephrourectomy in those patients. So again, just to go back to our European guideline to show that we, we are standing on some level of evidence, again, level of evidence to a nephrourectomy is considered standard of care. Uh, this can be done open, laparoscopic, robotically. We're gonna talk more about methodology here in a little bit. The bladder cuff is critical, and you see the level of evidence goes down because it's never really been tested in a prospective fashion, but I'm a strong believer that you need to really do a bladder cuff if you're gonna do this surgery that has high enough quality data that you could compare that to a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Finally, perioperative chemotherapy does play a role as well as single uh, post-operative dose of chemotherapy. So looking over and into our recommendations, again, if you look, the nephrourectomy is the strongest level re recommendation, the bladder cuff is important, a node dissection is important, and delivering a single dose of chemotherapy I think is just as important as well. And so this is kind of a, a flow diagram of how to manage these patients. And we all sort of do this when we, are, when we see these folks in the clinic, in the operating room. So you're gonna have a diagnostic evaluation that will include a CT urogram, urine cytology and cystoscopy. Most of that information you're gonna get with your flexible ureteroscopy. From that, you're gonna be able to triage patients into low and high risk, low risk tumors. You can do renal sparing if possible with close follow-up. High risk patients, for the most part, are under, going to undergo a, a, a radical nephrourectomy, lymphadenectomy, and bladder cuff. Many of them are going to be candidates for systemic-based chemotherapy, and we'll talk about that. Again, if there, someone has a low-risk tumor that you can't optimally treat, because of the challenges in staging, and what I mean by that is someone who you biopsy, and they keep having low-grade recurrences, and it's just not feeling right, I think you have to, at that point, consider that patient a candidate to undergo a nephrourectomy. And then if possible, consider uh, giving intravescular chemotherapy um, prior to catheter removal. This is a relatively complicated schematic, but it's basically summarizing how we would treat tumors that are different that are in the renal pelvis, in a calyx, in the distal, and in the mid and proximal ureter. And again, I, I think the big differences come here where if it's distal, and how I would define distal really depends on the patient, but for the most part, tumors that are basically up to the common iliac vessels, you can probably treat with a distal ureterectomy and a reimplant. As you get higher than the common iliacs, you know, that's when you're starting to have to be more creative with a Boari flap and, and other issues. So, um, and that's going to kind of be where we get to the mid and proximal most of those patients are gonna treat with a nephrourectomy. Endoscopically, um, there's always an option to treat the, the lower risk patients with ureteroscopy. Now, we always get into challenges with these cancers and how you manage some of the, the details. Again, most of this is a limitation of our staging system. So what do you do with a patient with a positive cytology, but no visible tumor? Many of those folks are gonna have carcinoma in situ. And so there's a couple ways to manage them. Uh, number one, I often will get repeated imaging on them in three months time. And what you're looking for, you're not going to see a filling defect, but you're just going to see some, shall some shallow kind of narrowing or some gray areas that show up where that almost looks like the radiologist has smudged it. Uh, and that's a filling defect that's starting to form. Uh, additionally, for me, those people, I'll do just sort of blinded biopsies of a calyx, the UPJ, the ureter, and the distal ureter. And you'd be surprised how many of the times you'll come back with carcinoma in situ on those biopsies. So I think you have to have a high bar of suspicion. Um, I personally would not remove someone's kidney for a cytology. I know other folks have. I just think the risk of removing a kidney that you know, has a positive cytology from somewhere in the lower tract, like from the bladder, for example, or the prostate is too high. So, I think that for the most part, if you have a high degree of suspicion, if you follow those people very closely, if you repeat your imaging, you're going to find the cause of this. Um, 
Second group of patients, people have a filling defect on the CAT scan, but you look and you can't find it. Again, I think you need to use uh, judicious biopsies uh, and, and that's gonna hopefully get you your answer. Now the size of the biopsies are always a challenge and having a good relationship with your OR staff, the people who do your supply chain and even your pathologists are really important. So I use three instruments. I use a, um, a uh, nitinol basket for papillary tumors. So you can open that basket up, snare a papillary tumor and pull that out. Uh, oftentimes you'll use a, um, you'll, you'll have to put a, a sheath up to be able to get a lot of that out. The second is you can use a piranha. Again, when you do the piranha, the whole thing is gonna have to come out. Piranha biopsies are very small. And then uh, if you have a sheath, you can also use a big opsy, which is backloaded. But again, it's a challenge because you have to backload it. I generally don't do something like an NMP22 or a fish because we're already fighting a challenge of, of having a tumor that you can barely see. So then to get this molecular information that you can't localize and can't do very much with, I think just makes it even more challenging. So I really don't favor that, um, but I'm sort of open to other folks who are doing it and have a good way of testing that. You know, one question that people bring up often is how well can we trust our biopsies? So this is again, a very nice paper uh, done by Adida when he was uh, at Memorial, he's at UT Southwestern now, comparing the molecular markers in, uh, from a biopsy, which is shown here in blue, versus the radical nephro U. And so you can see that for the most part, again, these Venn diagrams show the concurrence. For the most part, our biopsies do reflect pretty nicely what's going on in the tumor when, they, when you have a nephro U. So I think our biopsies are pretty good when we get them of cancer. The hard thing is really trying to localize many of these, these tumors. So I want to talk a little bit about nephrouretorectomy. I don't have any videos of this surgery. Um, the AUA today just released all their 2020 uh, upper track videos. I'm sure there's some very good uh, robotic videos that you can go take a look at. Um, again, there's a lot of ways to do this surgery. For the folks that are further along in their training, uh, I'm sure you've participated in these surgeries and there's a lot of ways to do them. Um, and the folks who haven't got a chance to be involved with them yet, again, take a look at some of the videos. This procedure has sort of evolved. I can remember when people said you had to do them open, then a lot of people were doing them laparoscopically. I really prefer the robotic approach in my hands. Uh, I can tell you that I'm not able to do a very good laparoscopic lymph node dissection. Um, there are some people who can, and that's great. But again, I think for most of us, the robotic way is the better way to go. Um, patients go home the next day or almost or, or two days afterwards. Um, you really can do a much better retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, and then you can go all the way down to the bladder and do the bladder cuff very nicely. So the excuse of we didn't do a bladder cuff because we couldn't get down there, I, I just don't think that that's reasonable if you're able to do the robotic surgery. Uh, realistically, when we talk about this operation, we break it up into three parts, the nephrectomy, the RPLND and the partial cystectomy or the bladder cuff. And I'm gonna talk about those independently. Again, I'd say you should, there's a lot of great videos. Um, I included this kind of just how I do it because I, I think everybody, you can learn something from that from everybody. I really prefer the XI when we book them at Northwestern, I request the XI. Um, I previously was doing this with the SI and, and reaching down the bladder cuff is harder. You, you can switch the arms, but for the XI, the reach is great. You can port hop if you need to. We have the air seal of both our VA and our hospital here. So I use the air seal. I think that gives a nice amount of space. Um, and then uh, it also, that port's nice because you can put a fan in. So for some bigger people, you sometimes need the fan to pull the abdominal contents down when you're doing your, your node dissection. And then I, I often will put a 15 port in lower around the umbilicus. I think that this is helpful um, to get the, the specimen out. And then our, our assistants just kind of like having that 15. Again, you're gonna put a big bag in anyway, so why not just use a 15 the whole case? Uh, for the arms, I don't use a traditional arm bar where the patient's like this. I tend to put a pillow in their arms and have them like this. It just, uh, I find that I've never had an, an issue with the arm during that. And then it allows me, because it's soft, that we can sort of move it around if we need to get uh, and do some work in the upper tracks on the upper part. Uh, this is a picture from surgery. This is a pretty thin person. Uh, and again, I put all my ports in a single line and it lets me go the entire length of the abdomen. Uh, this was before I was using a 15 port, but this is the air seal 12. 
Uh, and again, I I'll use this poor configuration for all my all my flank surgery, but but really this is pretty good for upper tract as well as for node dissections. This is before we had our XI, and this is um, when we're we did how we dock our SI, and you can see that. You know, I don't tend to dock the, th the last arm until we're getting the ureter up. Um, and so this is the top three. And again, um, this is with, with a couple 12s. And again, this is probably before we had the air seal. So here are the steps of the surgery. So you're gonna mobilize the colon. Uh, I really make a point of trying to not mobilize the kidney and any of the retroperitoneal content. So you keep the kidney up for your high layer dissection. Just like a kidney, you're gonna identify the ureter and then follow that all the way up. I dissect the hilum and I make sure that's nice and clean. And I do my node section at that time. And the reason I like that is that I think that if you staple and you take your kidney and then do your nodes, <clears throat> the problem is you've got all this nodal tissue that's got been stapled. And so trying to pick through that, I just, I, I worry about getting into the artery and the vein again that you've already stapled. So I do my node dissection at that point. Then we do the nephrectomy, we free up the upper pole. You can usually leave the adrenal alone and then I use the third arm usually to lift the kidney and ureter up, and I follow that all the way down. Um, and that's when I, you see the ureter sort of going into the bladder cuff. You find the pedicle, I usually take the pedicle, and then I open up medially, because uh, I like to go into the bladder and look inside and see the UO. I'll put a, a V-lock on the top and a V-lock on the bottom, and then close that after I've uh, separated it. We put a drain in and, uh, and the case is done. So for RPL and D, I think this is an important part of surgery. Clearly the retrospective data has shown that it's associated with better outcomes. There's some data that suggests that you need to get eight lymph nodes removed in order to really be, to call a negative lymph node dissection an N0. So it means you have to at least evaluate eight nodes and for those nodes to be negative, to be N0. I think the template matters, I'm gonna show you that in a second. Um, the thing to worry about though, if you do that left side, um, you know, the Cicerna Kylie is there. And so, you know, many of the big folks that you do, uh, you got to warn them that they're going to be on a low fat dial, diet for a while. If you don't, and you remove a big lymph node packet, uh, they will get a lymph leak and then that's going to be an issue. So uh, I clip all that pretty uh, judiciously, but I also warn, I also put people on a, on a Kylis diet for a little bit. This is the lymph node dissection that Serena Mateen uh, and folks uh, published. And it's a really nice, uh, kind of recommendation about where to start. So, and those are gonna be different based on right and left side. On the right side, this is very similar to our RPL and D that we do for testis cancer. And so it's gonna be, you know, you're gonna do, for the right side, you're gonna clean off the cava, the pre-cable, the paracables. And if you do that alone, you're gonna get 83% of the nodes. If you go over and do the intra-aorta cable, and the way that you would do that is just kind of go right along the aorta, and that'll let you roll that packet in, uh, you'll get up to 95%. On the left side, there's a bulky uh, packet that you're gonna get. And usually I start that right around the common iliac. I follow that all the way up to the renal hilum. And again, if you get the intra-aortic cable region, it's around 90% of the lymph nodes. You'll modify that packet based on where the location of the tumor is. So a, a mid urethral tumor, you're gonna do, probably you're gonna get commons. And for a distal, you know, you may not go up and do up top, but you're definitely gonna get the pelvics as well. Um, this is being tested prospectively, and again, it'll be really interesting to see how that affects outcomes. So intravascular chemotherapy, I think that that's something that's uh, relatively new, uh, even though the data, if you look at it, goes back to 2011. <coughs> Excuse me. And that's a single dose of chemotherapy after you take your bladder cup. And the reason is that you're, you're constantly, you know, jerking on the ureter, and that's causing these cancer cells to come down. Um, and so you can give it either before you do that surgery or you, the way I give it is I have the patient follow up in a week. We do a cystogram at our hospital or in our clinic. If that cystogram is negative, then when they go to our office, my nurses put a dose of chemotherapy and the patient holds it for two hours and, they, um, and then we take the catheter out and then the patient voids. But that definitely is associated with lower risk of recurrence. Otherwise, you'll find that over the next year, you know, you'll have a significant rate of patients that have these uh, lower track recurrences. So this is a nice study. Vic Packiam, who was a resident here at, at University of Chicago, uh, that we worked with at the VA, and then now he was at Mayo Clinic. I think he actually is faculty now. Um, so this is a randomized trial that he's doing. So it's a single arm trial. Patients will get an uh, gemcitabine an hour before that bladder cuff is done. 
and the primary outcome is recurrence-free survival. So it'll be really interesting to see um, the data that he finds from this. My take home from this is that you should do the full surgery if you're going to do this operation, and that includes nodes, it includes a bladder cuff, and again, I think a dose of chemotherapy after is very helpful. So in follow-up, and again, this is the European guideline, and the level of evidence is that you kind of risk stratify patients. So for low-risk tumors, they should get cystoscopy at three months, and then if that's clean, nine months, and then yearly, this is very similar to what we do with low-risk bladder cancer. For high-risk bladder cancer, again, all of this is after nephrourectomy, they're gonna get cystoscopies done essentially every three months for the next two years, and upper tract imaging every three to six months. Um, after kidney sparing, you, for example, if you do a distal ureterectomy, I tend to do ureteroscopy in those people every three months for the next two years. Because I, even though your margins are negative, I, I tend to worry about those folks in follow-up. So I want to talk a little bit about systemic chemotherapy. So stay with me here. I think this is important that we are all involved in this discussion because you folks uh, that are in training, this will be something that you're going to be including in your standard of care. Now, we don't seem to think about upper tract nearly as much as we do for bladder. For bladder, it's become our standard of care that you, you talk to patients about getting neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And some of that may be that we don't necessarily think that it's as effective. And, you know, if you look here at response rate, you know, the response rate to bladder cancer is about 38%, but for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy for upper tract, it seems to be a little less than that. And some of that just may be we're able to stage bladder cancer much better than we can ahead of time for upper tract. And so they may actually have a lot more disease there than, uh, than we think. And so all the reasons to consider the neoadjuvant approach for upper tract uh, versus adjuvant chemotherapy are all listed here. So, you know, is staging a challenge? Well, certainly it's a staging for neoadjuvant. And so you may be over-treating some patients that have minimal disease. Uh, is it effective for early treatment of micrometastatic disease? Well, clearly for, for neoadjuvant it is because uh, you're treating that disease while it's still in place. I think the most important reason, other than the oncologic parts of it, are that these patients are going to certainly take a hit from a kidney function perspective when you take that kidney out. And so you're going to be faced with a patient whose GFR, by all means, are going to decrease after surgery. And if they have bad pathology, they may be stuck. Does it work? It certainly works in both settings. You know, tolerance of platinum certainly is better before surgery than after. Um, we can get some information about how well it works and then the overall survival benefit, un unclear at this point. So this is, uh, you know, slide comparing five studies looking at patients that, looking at their GFR before nephro-U compared to after nephro-U. And you can see that you know, platinum eligibility went from as high as 57% afterwards to as low as 16%. So you're going to have at least 30% of patients that have a decline in platinum eligibility after nephro-ureterectomy. And there is some data that this is very effective. So here we have, you know, prospective trials that have been done that show that complete response rate that goes anywhere from 10 to 40%. The key thing is to get people down to a, a low invasive state. So stage one or less, up to 75% of those patients. So this is probably best studied by the ECOG-Akron uh, 8141 randomized trial where patients received, uh, it's a phase one where they were enrolled to, um, to receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy before nephrorebutorectomy, and it was based on how their GFR was. So if they had a good GFR greater than 50, they got accelerated MVAC and they got four cycles. If they had a, a moderate GFR of 30 to 50, they got uh, gemcitabine carboplatin. This study is now currently closed. Uh, the early reports that has just been published in abstract form show a 14% complete response rate and more than 62% of patients are less than stage two. So we'll have a lot more information based on how well this works after uh, the studies published, but I'll tell you that the good news as far as toxicity is that only a quarter of patients had a grade three or more toxicity. 80% of patients got all of their chemotherapy. So, it, you know, anecdotally, we've had patients that went on this uh, and did really pretty well. So I think this is worth a discussion for people. And the people I talk about this with are essentially anyone with high grade upper tract cancer. Um, and what that discussion is, is, hey, there's some data that this may be helpful. 
Um, we don't know what your kidney function is going to be like after surgery. Um, would you be interested in considering you giving you chemotherapy ahead of time? There's some people that say absolutely not, and that's fine. We go straight to the operating room, but there's some folks that are interested, and I think connecting them with our medical oncologist makes a ton of sense. We're lucky enough that my medical oncologist is next door, uh, and I'm able to get them in and ha usually have a visit at the same time. And if nothing else, that's informative for them afterwards if they need to get chemotherapy after surgery, and certainly for trial involvement. We've got a lot more data more recently about adjuvant chemotherapy. I think many people have heard of this PALP trial. So these are people with invasive upper tract carcinoma uh, that were able to get neoad and get adjuvant chemotherapy within 90 days of their nephro U. And so, you know, 71 patients um, uh, the, that, uh, I'm sorry, 71 institutions, 261 patients. So this is really an all hands on deck effort and you know what's really nice about this study it was randomized to surveillance versus chemotherapy is that they risk stratified not risk stratified but uh, stratified treatment based on their renal function so if they had a good gfr greater than 50 they got gem cis if they had a gfr that was between 30 and 50 they got carboplatin and so you can all read this paper um, it was just published in lancet oncology i think about a month ago and here are the survival curves. This is uh, overall survival, and this is metastasis-free survival. The orange or red line here on top are people who got chemotherapy, and you can see that the hazard ratio is you know, 0.45, so a 55% improvement in, in hazard for these patients that got chemotherapy. But I think that the key part to this analysis is a subgroup analysis. And so looking here, the people, who, the patients who were in zero benefited more. Patients who got cisplatin benefited more, again, pointing home that having better renal function leads to better outcomes. People who had margin negative did better. And interestingly, people who had locally advanced disease did better than people who were T2. So this is a really good study. Take a look at it if you can. I think that the key point th that we saw from this is that while you know, the rate of people being able to get platinum ahead of time was 58%, it went down. And you know, PALP dealt with people that were GFRs of 30 or greater, but for patients that were less than 30, they certainly couldn't be you know, included in this study. And so what do you do with those patients? And that's kind of where the next generation of therapies really comes in. And I'm gonna talk about that next, but I think for the take home here, consider adjuvant chemotherapy for anyone that's stage two or greater. So the last bit I'm gonna talk about are more targeted therapies. And again, that goes back to our FGF receptor three. And so why is that a rational target? Well, it is because we think two thirds of patients with upper tract urothelial carcinoma have alterations in FGF receptor three. And this is kind of a high power view of that. Again, you can see that the majority of these patients have these mutations. And so, just recently, within the last uh, six months to a year, ertafentanib was approved for second line bladder cancer uh, in patients that have an upper tract or have an FGF receptor alteration. And this is just a, a summary figure from the New England Journal paper. Again, another good paper. I hope many folks cover that in your journal clubs. Um, ertafentanib given daily, and you dose titrate that based on, uh, on side effects. You actually dose it up until a patient gets an elevated out FOS. But the response in patients that have an FGF receptor 3 alteration is up to 40%. Uh, and while the grade 3 events is in found in two-thirds of patients, for the most part, it's pretty well tolerated. So we think that that's going to potentially play a role in upper tract. And this paper, I think, actually was just published about a week and a half ago uh, with uh, infogratinib, and that is QED's FGF receptor 3 inhibitor. The top Kaplan-Meier line here are patients that have upper tract urothelial carcinoma they report a disease control rate of 100%. So this is only eight patients, but a CR1, a partial response in three and four stable disease. They now have a trial, which we're gonna be opening here, and I think it's gonna be opening across the country, um, is gonna be adjuvant FGF receptor three for uh, infogratinib for patients, and they wanna have 85% upper tract. So I think it's gonna be really interesting to see if that can be used to present, prevent uh, disease recurrence and again, it's going to be very good for those patients who have impaired renal function. 
want to talk a little bit about BCG for upper track. And I, I would say this is a little bit of a data free zone. So you got to give me a, a bit of a break here. Um, I definitely use BCG for patients, but it's select patients. It's certainly not a go to. Um, I probably use that most in people that have uh, a solitary kidney and a high grade tumor. And, and they, you know, we've talked about dialysis. They'd like to do everything they can to avoid dialysis. So we give BCG a shot. And there's a couple of ways that this can be done. It can be done from below, uh, where a patient has a stent and you place it in their, and you put BCG in their bladder like you do everyone else. And then you have them lie flat in your clinic for two hours. Now, of course, you need to make sure that they have reflux. So usually when I'm evaluating that person, I'll put a stent in the operating room and I put their stent in and we'll, we'll do a cystogram and make sure they reflux. Um, again, I don't think this is a great maneuver. In general, the, what I find is that the lower the tumor the patient has, the better a response they have. So I don't think the putting BCG in their bladder and having them lay either flat or lay with their feet up works very well for a renal pelvis tumor. For those patients, probably the best thing you can do is, I've heard two possible things. One, we'll do this where we put a perk in and then we'll drip BCG in. At our institution, we have to admit those patients, but I, I'm sure that can be done in the clinic. Um, another possible way to do it, I've heard, again, people have done this, is they'll put an open-ended catheter up to the renal pelvis and then they'll inject BCG, usually by gravity, what patients uh, laying flat in clinic. So there's a lot of ways to get that up. This is Studer's data. Again, you can see from these Kaplan-Meier curves, this is uh, the green uh, survival curve is our patients with carcinoma in situ. The orange are patients that are, it's given in the adjuvant setting when they have a TA or T1 that they've treated with endoscopy. Interestingly, when you look at this, three vials of BCG. So in our shortage era, if you're gonna give six doses, that's 18 doses of BCG, that, that's a challenge. Uh, so you really want to make sure this is really for the right patient. This is a summary of the data that's been published. They report, and then you can see that this is a mix of giving it anagrade versus retrograde, and they re report a response rate of about 80%. I think, though, if you look at the recurrence and progression rate, it's pretty significant. So uh, I really, again, only use this for patients that have really a solitary kidney and don't want to have dialysis. So uh, be very cautious with this. And um, I think there's a lot more we can do. And that gets to Mitogel. And I think that's pretty interesting. There's been data that uh, Seth Lerner has presented. This is, these are his slides. And, and the thought is that is there, if there's a way that we could put a chemotherapeutic agent in the upper tract and get it to stay there, uh, we have a potential for it to work. And so that's where this Mitogen comes from. Again, I do nothing with this company. Um, but it's very interesting that, you know, it's a, the, the gel is a liquid at, 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 at room temperature. And then when you put it in the body, it actually becomes solid. And so um, the way that this is done is that there's actually a pump. You put this together, an injector, and then you push this into the renal pelvis and try and hit the, so the spot where the carcinoma is. And so this was sort of the initial experience with this. You can see that, you know, here is a patient that's got a, a tumor. Uh, again. This is done ahead of time, and this is a relatively bulky tumor. And then when you, when you come back and, and you see this patient in follow-up, uh, you can see that for the most part, that's gone away. So of the 22 patients that were originally enrolled, and I should say that when this work was originally was done, uh, this was really done in patients that were low-grade cancers, but the patient couldn't undergo a nephrourethromy. So this is kind of a very narrow window currently for uh, where this is being tested. Again higher volume patient, low grade cancers that uh, the patient couldn't get a nephro U. And again, of the 22 patients uh, that were enrolled, 14 completed treatment, they had eight patients that had a, had a complete response. So this is the clinical trial, this is the Olympus trial. So the patients were screened, enrolled, um, and then the primary uh, objective was efficacy. The way that this is done is that the patient goes to the operating room weekly and they get an injection uh, of the mitogen agent, then they get six weeks off, followed by the primary disease evaluation point. Interestingly, they could get booster doses done every month uh, if, they, uh, if they would like. And so they had follow-ups done at three, six, nine, and 12 months. And so um, 
Again, the target population was confirmed, higher volume, but low grade non-invasive cancers. And so this is the uh, results of the study. So 58% complete response rate, durability, the longest durability they had was nine months. And that's just because of evaluation time, partial responses in 14% and 26%, uh, they had no response. Side effects pretty well tolerated. Uh, overall, the AE rates were, were relatively low. So I think, you know, it'll be really interesting to see where this ends up. I love the innovative nature of this. Uh, I think this is something that likely is going to be in your hands potentially in the future. So we'll be interested to see where it comes. So that is the end of my talk. And we're right at 45 minutes. Um, I have practice questions that my chief resident, uh, Tana Amara Sakura, put together for us to go over. So we have something more to talk about. But it looks like there's 20, 26 questions. So I don't know if, if you want to, if we should do those now or you want me to do the questions. I'm open. We have these set up to do as a poll. Um, maybe we can do one or two questions and then we can tackle some of these uh, Q and A. Uh, we'll also put any unanswered questions from the Q and A up on our website with written responses. So I'm sure we'll get to all of them eventually. So we could do a couple together. Great. All right. So 76 year old uh, man with diabetes hematuria, a five millimeter filling defect in the right distal ureter and it's low grade. So what's our next step? All right, perfect. Ureteroscopic tumor ablation. And I, I think that's a, you know, that's what, that's what I would answer. I think that's a great way to treat this. So could you do a distal ureterectomy? So 45 patients said that. Again, um, a five millimeter tumor and it's distal. Uh, I mean, again, if they develop the stricture down the road, that may be the best way to manage that. Uh, and so here's our answer. Uh, and again, uh, the answer was, uh, was tumor ablation, okay? Second question, 49-year-old uh, woman, chronic renal insufficiency, the creatinine of two, a CT shows stable bilateral hydronephrosis, small stones, a soft tissue filling defect in the right ureter, midway between the UPJ and the iliac. Cytology's normal papillary lesion, it's excised, and histology reveals low grade. So renal insufficiency, low grade, what's the next step? Yeah, retrograde and ureteroscopy. So yeah, and that was the answer that they came up with. So I think that makes a ton of sense. Again, the patient's already got renal insufficiency. You're trying to preserve renal function and, you know, but it's a little great. So certainly doing that and doing a follow-up and you never know what you're gonna find in the future, but that's the next best step. All right, a 79 year old man with congestive heart failure, gross hematuria and, um, a CT shows a six millimeter distal ureteral filling defect. The cytology is positive in this patient and they have high grade carcinoma. Um, the next step is, is what? So he, he's got a positive cytology. All right, so a little more disagreement here. So the answer the AUA said was ureteroscopy. And again, I, I think the big thing here, and maybe the way that I read it um, may have pushed you that way, but uh, this patient really hasn't had a biopsy yet. So uh, you know, the, the key thing would be to do a ureteroscopic biopsy and laser ablation. So again, you, you, you have a cytology, but not a biopsy yet. And, uh, and that, that would be the, the next step for the patient. Okay. So a 78-year-old man with 
uh, that had a radical cystectomy and ileal conduit. Um, following radiation therapy, pathology showed a T3B cancer, so a high-risk cystectomy patient. Uh, CT is fine at one year, but at two year, there's marked right hydro uh, and a very thin renal parenchyma. So the kidney is not doing well anyway. They're trying to give you that hint. Lupogram shows a very tight narrowing of the distal ureter two centimeters above the ureteroilial junction. And he's symptomatic. He's asymptomatic, but and his creatinine is one six. Right, so they throw you a lot of a lot of uh, hints here, and you know the key things are the kidney doesn't work, patient's creatinine stable. And I think the key thing is that it's the right side, right? So the rate of stricture on the right side is pretty low; it's in the neighborhood, neighborhood of eight to nine percent. Um, left side obviously is twice as high, and then the the key thing is the location that it's not at the ureteroenteric anastomos; it's higher than that. So all those things point to a to a, a tumor. All right, question five, looks like my kids snuck this one in on us. Um, so a 59 year old man with a solitary kidney and normal renal function um, has a left renal pelvic filling defect on CT urogram. Ureteroscopy shows a 3.5 centimeter solid mass uh, that goes into the lower pole and biopsy shows high grade. Bladder biopsies and metastatic evaluation are negative. Right, so unfortunately, I think the things that push you towards dialysis and nephro U in this patient are the age and the fact that the patient is healthy otherwise. So I definitely think that, you know, it's a hard discussion, but probably the right one in this case. Do you want to keep going or should we? Let's, uh, let's get to some of these questions. Um, happy to see that people are getting a lot of these questions correct. So that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so we'll get started. So the first question is related to concern uh, for seeding to the upper tract in your diagnostic workup. Mm -hmm. um, under what conditions might you not do it if there's maybe a big visible bladder tumor? Um, and as a secondary question to that, after you ureteroscopy, do you always leave a stent? Um, and how do you time your stent removal for nephro ureterectomy? Well, a lot of questions there. So. Um, I tend to not worry about this cancer cells blowing back up. Um, I just, I know there's retrospective data. It needs to be studied more. I think that if you're concerned, you need to do an evaluation. Um, and so I generally don't do retrogrades at the time of my TURs unless I have a reason for concern or the patient didn't get a CT urogram. In general, my patients have already gotten a CT urogram before we're doing a TUR. Um, what I sometimes find is if you can't see the ure ureteral orifice and you're doing a TUR and then you unroof this, T this UO and then like tumor <laughs> comes out of it, I, you got to look at that point. Um, I think though that you should always be suspicious of the upper tracts and what I often will see, I see a lot of folks with BCG and responsive bladder cancer and you find that they do really well for a year with BCG and then all of a sudden they start showing up with cancer on one side of the bladder or the other. I worry about those patients. I'll scan them and I'll look for an upper tract tumor. Um, stent placement, generally I usually, if I'm up there doing biopsies, I'm gonna leave a stent. I'm not gonna leave a dangle. Um, and then I usually get those folks in for treatment pretty fast if they're going straight to surgery. Um, so meaning that I don't remove a stent between biopsy and nephro-U if they're going straight to nephro-U. Now, if they're going for uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, then every patient's patient different. So if they have a distal tumor and they're obstructed, I'll leave it in. If they have a, like a renal pelvis tumor and they don't need a stent, I'll pull it in the office and have them get their chemo. So I generally am not bothered by the stent. Um, I think there is a reaction around it. Um, it doesn't really make my surgery harder, 
in some cases it helps me, you know, if, if it's a challenging case, I can help me find the ureter and lift it up. So I generally get the stent in and I, I don't find it's that big of a deal. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, could you review for us a little bit on the evidence for RPLND and in whom you'd perform this on? Um, sounds like there may be some practice variation across sites, some concern for operative time, ascites, and things like that. Yeah, so I mean, my belief is that if you're if you're going to take a patient to the operating room and take out their kidney and ureter, you should be removing their lymph nodes. Um, they should get an RPLND. I, you know, I know that there's a concern for frail patients and operative time, but again, um, you know, are you going to go and lift up the aorta and go underneath it to do those nodes? Probably not. But I tell you, you know, the more of these surgeries you do you know, just lifting up those nodes and then clip, clip, clip all the way along and taking them out, you can do that pretty fast. So I can't think of a patient that I've not done an RPL and D on or at least a nodal dissection of, for example, left side pre-aortic periaortics, on the right side pre-cables, paracables. And am I hitting eight nodes? It's a lot of it depends on the pathologist and the amount of fatty tissue they have. So I do it in almost everybody. And again, a lot of that is driven by um, an oncology sort of background. I think the people who, I don't want to say do less of them, are less likely to do a node dissection. But again, you've seen the guideline-based data. All of that is driven by people who recommend that. Certainly, there's a quality of care, and that's, all, that's kind of what you get to with the retrospective data, where they show like improved survival if you do a node dissection. Well, again, a lot of that is provider-based. Um, I worry about the chylus leak in patients, and so I clip as much as I can. So I'm not just using like a fenestrated bipolar, lifting a hunk of nodal tissue up and just using monopolar cautery. I try to lift it up and, you know, there, there is clips that you can put in uh, yourself with the robot or even a vessel sealer is a nice way to do it. But I really recommend it. Again, um, and part of that is, I remember the, for one of the first patients I operated on, uh, just at a fellowship had one node positive uh, and that was it. And he ended up living another eight years before dying of something else. But again, if I would have done a node dissection, you would have never have seen that. And he clearly would have had metastatic disease. So I, I really think that you, if you're questioning, should I, do, should I do a bladder cuff? Should I do a, um, a node dissection? You know, then you really have to ask, are, should you really be doing the surgery? Um, and again, Maybe that maybe you need to do it with a partner, one of your own partners, so you can make the surgery go as fast as you can. I, I just again, if you if you skip on the on the on the bladder cuff, and a lot of people do that, they just follow the ureter down as far as they can, and they put a, a clip on it. You you will have a bladder recurrence, and those are tough um, because the patient wants to know why you, they thought you removed that, and again, those aren't easy to take out. So I, I would say you know until you get fast enough where you can do those surgeries yourself or with a resident, then do them with a partner. Um, but I, I think that, you, you know, the patient gets one chance to do the, get the best operation. And so, you know, I, I think you just try and do that as fast as you can. Yeah. Um, and related to the bladder cuff, um, what's your timing of uh, intravesical chemo afterwards? Do you get a cystogram and everybody? Yeah. Yeah. We, and, and that's because, you know, the problem is if you do that with the XI, you know, finding that lateral part of the bladder can be harder. And I've had people who've leaked for a month and I'll tell you, uh, that's painful. But at the same time, I thought every one of those people, you thought you got it done well. And I even, even I do a, I, I try and do a bit of a cystogram in the operating room where we have the catheter exposed and we fill it and we look for leaks. Uh, so you'll be surprised how many people just didn't heal for whatever reason. So I do get a cystogram in everybody, make sure that's negative. And again, what, what happens is we, I book them for two appointments. They get a cystogram and then they come up to my office. If that cystogram's negative, then we do a, um, we, do, we give them a dose of gym side to be right then. They hold it for an hour, an hour and a half, and then um, we pull their catheter. So right so then. So the patient after they've been discharged. Yep, yep, absolutely. Very cool. Um, and then one last question. Uh, do you employ percutaneous approaches? for biopsy or for management of upper tract? I, I, not routinely. Um, I think there was people, that was going on a little bit when I was a resident. I think um, the challenge with that is number one, seeding. You know, seeding the tract, spreading, it's a, it's a terribly kind of sticky cancer that 
I, I think that's a, you're putting in, you know, a sheath and doing work like that. So, so I generally don't do it. The only time I ever think a perk is helpful uh, is if you're going to give someone BCG and you're going to put it in and trickle it down. And again, in many of those patients, um, they're already facing sort of, they can't get a nephro you. So, you know, that, that's a, you know, perfect isn't, isn't possible, but you're trying to do the best you can for the patient. So generally I don't do that. Perfect. Um, well, there's still quite a few really good questions here in the Q&A, so we'll get those answered and on the website as soon as possible. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, so Dr. Meeks, I just want to thank you again for your time and sharing your experience and expertise with all of us. Um, Thanks, again. Thanks for having me. Thanks for yeah. doing this. And we're going to move over to our other Zoom room um, and start there around 10.10, uh, so I'll see everybody there uh, in about 10 minutes.